All right, good evening. Hello, it's wonderful to see so many of you again this evening. I'm Heinrich Jäger, my colleagues at Nagel and I, we welcome you to our second guest lecture in this series on physics and contemporary architecture. So as most of you probably already know, these lectures are a companion to our course with the same name here at the University of Chicago, where we introduce college students to concepts in physics by connecting these concepts to the built environment. So in this series of lectures, we hear from leading practitioners about what is possible in terms of both the functional and also the aesthetic aspects of an architectural structure. And if you go back, the need of humankind to shelter and thus create structures that shield from direct exposure to wind and rain, um, that of course goes way, way back. And with that need come inventive ways of not just using found materials, but also manipulating and processing materials into useful shapes and modules such as bricks. And so today we'll hear from Chad Krauss about earthen building techniques, starting with clay, one of the oldest building materials. Well before concrete, steel, timber and stone, humans, gathered clay and with it formed bricks, cities, and empires, as, as Chad writes. And very intriguingly, clay-based building techniques such as rammed earth are now coming back to the fore because of significant advantages over, say, cement in terms of carbon emissions. And I bet we'll hear about that too. So Chad's talk is entitled Tectonics of Earth Architecture. And it will examine current research that aims to advance earth and building techniques and present the architecture of Dirtwork Studio, the studio that Chad leads. He is an associate professor of architecture at the University of Kansas and a licensed architect. He teaches courses on architectural theory, mass timber, earth and architecture, and architectural design studio. His design build named Dirtworks Studio received multiple design awards, including the Architecture Master Prize, AIA Design Awards, Architects Newspaper Best of Design Award. And in 2014, Krauss was the recipient of the ACSA Design Build Award. He's also an editor of the book Design Build Education and an editor of the journal Technology, Architecture and Design, TAD. And prior to teaching, Krauss worked for Pritzker Prize laureate Shigeru Ban, where he worked on projects such as metal shutter houses, the Nomadic Museum, and Furniture House 5. So just before we get started, one more quick announcement. We'll have the Q&A at the end. And until that, everybody's microphone will stay muted. But of course, you can put questions in the chat at any time. So with that, please go ahead, chat. OK, great. Uh, thank you so much, Heinrich and Sid, for inviting me to participate in this really interesting course. Um, and thank you, everyone else, for joining me today. Um, so my talk is Tectonics of Earth Architecture, and um, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about clay, um, which I call the kind of prima materia or the prime material, the, um, the original material. And what I mean by that is, as Heinrich mentioned, long before we were building with concrete, steel, and glass, um, before they became the primary building materials of our age, and even before timber and stone defined much of pre-industrial architecture, humans gathered clay and with it we formed bricks, uh, cities, empires, and even ideologies. Uh, soil particles are characterized by their size from coarse to fine and are generally divided into gravel, sand, silt, and clay as depicted in this chart. You can see here there are a few different kinds of classification systems we use. So let's first just start with, with gravel, um, which can describe uh, particles ranging from two and a half inches in diameter to a little larger than a 16th inch diameter. Um, and we all have a pretty decent idea of what gravel looks like since, since most of you have probably experienced driving along a gravel road or walking along a gravel path. Um, for illustrative purposes, I've just taken a pretty average size uh, grain of gravel, and I've enlarged it by 10, um, which you can see here on the screen. Now, um, as we 
move along this spectrum of, of uh, soil size, soil particle sizes, um, we, we come to sands. Uh, sands um, are approximately 1 16th inch in diameter to about 25 thousandths of an inch. In other words, pretty small, uh, smaller than you can see with the naked eye. Um, and again, uh, for the sake of comparison, I'm showing an average uh, size grain of sand, um, again, enlarged by 10. So now to be clear, uh, between this grain of gravel and this grain of sand, there are particles of every size increment, uh, with the finest gravel being just a merest fraction uh, of an inch larger than the coarsest sand. So, you know, we can think about this as a continuum. Um, so next, after sand, comes silt. And silt particles range in size from 0 0.0025 inches to 0 0.00015 inches. These particles are so small, you can't really see them with the human eye. Um, in fact, they're so small that there's not really a convenient unit in the US customary system to use. So uh, we often um, use the, the, um, the unit micron to describe these. Um, and because they are so small, you really can't see them with the human eye, but when they are aggregated or amassed, they form a kind of soft, silky smooth textured earth. And again, for the sake of comparison, I'm showing here on screen um, a, um, a silt particle um, enlarged by 10. And you may or may not be able to see that on your screen. It's at this point quite small. Um, next, of course, we come to clay. Now, clays are really interesting. Um, they are the smallest of these four um, uh, soil classifications, but it's not really their size that uh, I think is fascinating. It's, it's really their, their morphology. So um, unlike gravel, um, sand, and silt, uh, clay is not granular uh, in the sense that it's made up of, of sort of round or um, angular grains, but rather, consists of plate-like sheets with tetrahedral or octahedral morphologies, um, as you can see here in this uh, kind of uh, uh, very enlarged uh, uh, view of what these clay uh, plates look like. Um, this unique characteristic uh, imbues clay with the ability to transform from malleable when wetted to a strong binder when dried. Um, this clay is essentially the glue that holds soils together. Now, any soil will consist of a wide variety of particle sizes, often spanning across the full spectrum of gravels to clays. However, the proportion of each of those particle sizes will determine the overall characteristic of the soil. Um, here we can see typically a, a kind of typical classification system um, where we can begin to characterize and name these different soil types, such as a sandy clay loam or a silty clay. Today, of course, uh, I'm here to talk about earthen architecture. That is earth that we uh, use as a building material. And in order to know if a soil is suitable to build with, we have to conduct a series of tests, uh, particularly uh, since soils vary so much from place to place. Um, the most basic uh, test is to determine the particle size distribution. In other words, um, how much gravel or sand or silt or clay we have in the soil. And there are a couple of ways to test this, such as using a series of nested sieves. You can see a sieve here on the slide in the middle. Um, and here's some nested sieves uh, sitting in a Rotap machine. Um, the machine basically rotates in a circular motion and then makes a kind of shaking or tapping motion to encourage soil particles to kind of move through the sieves. Um, and at each sieve uh, with progressively finer meshes, it traps the soil particles of a certain range. Uh, we can then empty the contents of each sieve out and weigh them and determine what percentage of the overall uh, soil is made up of that uh, fraction of, of, um, of particle size. Um, and while the sieves are pretty good at allowing us to measure coarse particles like gravels and sands, um, they're not great at helping us discern between silts and clays, which are so fine that they get caught even in the finest meshes. And so for that, we usually use a pipette test. But in any case, uh, with these tools and measurements, we can characterize the soil particle distribution. And this can tell us quite a bit about the soil suitability for a variety of applications.
So for earthen materials, you typically want a soil that is uh, non-uniform. Um, that, that means um, that the particle sizes are distributed across that spectrum and well graded, um, meaning that the, it contains particles of a wide range of sizes that are as evenly distributed as possible. Um, and we can illustrate this using a graph um, such as this one. Um, uh, but allow me to maybe illustrate this a little differently. Um, why uh, is it important to have a non-uniform, well-graded soil? Um, well, our goal when we're using earth as a building material is to make it strong through densification and also through binding of the particles. So imagine having particles of all one size. And no matter how much you compact or vibrate the soil, you will always have void spaces between them of a fairly significant size relative to the whole. Now imagine that you added a smaller particle size to the mix and you were able to completely densify theoretically the material. Uh, you can see here that we have far fewer voids relative to the mass of the soil. And yet again, if we were to add even a smaller particle size, we increase density and so on and so on. So as we nest these different particles uh, together, we can increase uh, the density of the overall. Okay. So next we need to determine how much uh, moisture or water uh, to add to the soil. If we try to compress dry soils together, um, we will find it quite difficult actually for the soil particles to slip past each other, especially if they're angular, which would be ideal if we want those particles to stay in place once we've densified it. Um, so we need to lubricate them. And, um, and we usually do that through water. However, you know, of course, too much lubrication can be a bad thing because water occupies space. And once the water dries, it leaves voids behind. So really our goal then is to add just enough uh, moisture to lubricate all the grains of soil, but without leaving any excess moisture that will contribute to increased voids. Um, and this we call surface saturation or optimum moisture content. Um, <clears throat> now, we can determine the optimum moisture content. Um, and if we are able to do that, we can get closer to achieving what we call maximum uh, dry density, um, which typically results in a stronger material. Um, we use the project compaction test method uh, to determine optimum moisture contents. Um, on the right uh, here, you can see um, a project compaction hammer, some molds and other required equipment. And to the left, you can see a chart where we plot the optimum moisture content curve. Basically through a series of uh, trial and error tests, we can plot um, the density of the, of the mix based on water content, plot the curve, and then determine what the optimum moisture content is. Okay, so now we know what the soil is comprised of and we know how much moisture to add to achieve maximum dry density. Next, um, it's useful to know how plastic the soil is. And by this, I mean the soil's ability to undergo permanent deformation under stress without cracking. Uh, a series of tests called the Atterberg limits have been developed to determine a soil's shrinkage. It's plastic, it's plastic, liquid, and, um, well, it's, it's shrinkage limits, it's plastic, and it's liquid limits. And from here, we can determine its linear shrinkage, and then we can also determine its pl uh, plasticity index. Um, studies have shown, um, such as the one that this uh, flowchart comes from, that uh, linear shrinkage and plasticity index are perhaps the most accurate indicators of whether soil will be suitable for at least certain types of earthen building techniques, uh, largely uh, you know, rammed earth and, and similar compacted uh, earth materials, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, it's not always necessary to conduct all of these tests, of course, but the more we know about the soil, the more confident we can be in its suitability for any given task. Um, ultimately, uh, one of the most important criteria for earth as a building material is its compressive strength. Um, compressive strength is um, the maximum amount of a compressive load a material can bear before fracturing. Um, conversely, we can talk about tensile strength, which we can visualize it as the capacity of a material to resist being so, sort of pulled apart. Um, and most dense materials such as stone or brick or concrete or earth uh, have relatively high compressive strengths and relatively low tensile strengths. 
And usually these low tensile strengths are uh, addressed um, if needed uh, with the addition of tensile reinforcement, such as steel bars and concrete or natural fibers and mud brick. Um, here you can see on screen a few rammed earth cylinders that I prepared and crushed using a compressive strength load frame. Okay, so now that we have examined the classification of soils and their particles and the various ways to test soils for suitability as a building material, now I'd like to briefly uh, discuss the variety of techniques of earth architecture. Um, long before we were, uh, you know, we learned to center pulverized limestone into cement for use in concrete, uh, we harnessed the binding power of clay to form adobe bricks, uh, cob walls, and rammed earth. And in fact, there are many earth building techniques. Um, many societies and cultures have used earth as a building material. Um, but for the sake of this lecture, I'd like to classify them into four categories. Uh, molded earth, sculpted earth, rammed earth, and compressed earth, or compressed earth block. Now, as you can see from this diagram, um, these techniques differ based on mainly two criteria. Um, their method for acquiring strength, that is whether or not they're modestly densified and then dried, um, or whether they're more aggressively densified, and the form that they take, whether it's unitized in the form of bricks or some, or or panels, or whether they're made monolithically. So let's examine each one of these categories in a little bit more detail, and we'll take a few. Um, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at a few examples. So let's start with molded earth, um, the term that I'm using to describe mud bricks of all kinds. Um, in every culture that is used, mud brick, you know, these have different names. You're probably familiar with adobe. Um, a mud brick that's uh, used in the uh, Central uh, Americas and Southwest uh, North America. Um, and these, these uh, materials are characterized by being unitized, that is made into standard modules or, or units, and sun-dried. So mud bricks are generally formed using a clay soil that's kneaded together with a fibrous material such as straw and um, often uh, with reusable molds to form standard size bricks. Um, these bricks are allowed to, um, to bake in the heat of the sun and uh, that causes the water to evaporate out of the brick and allows the clay to bind the soil particles together. Consequently, mud bricks have very low embodied energy. Uh, and when I say embodied energy, what I really mean there is the amount of energy required to extract, fabricate and sort of apply or implement a specific material. So we're thinking about sort of it's, it's um, how much energy it took to, to bring that thing into being, uh, including transportation and, and so on. And I'll, I'll go into more detail about embodied energy a little bit later. But needless to say, the embodied energy for mud bricks is very low. And that's good if we wish to be good stewards of the earth and if we wish to slow or halt or even reverse climate change. Um, due to the minimal amount of formwork required, Mud bricks are relatively simple to make. And because they are modular, um, they're relatively easy to use in constructing a building so, or you know, building component like walls or vaults or domes. However, uh, due to their unitized nature, they do require some craftspeople who have masonry, uh, you know, skills in masonry techniques. Also due to their strength coming from modest kneading or compaction and through sun drying, Mud bricks tend to be not as strong as rammed or compressed earth building techniques, which we'll look at in a bit. So here's an example of an adobe structure. This is the uh, de Vargas house in Santa Fe, New Mexico. This house is said to be one of the oldest homes in, in the United States. Um, here, as is typical, the mud brick is covered and protected by a mud or lime plaster. And the plaster coating uh, will require uh, routine maintenance or care. Um, an occasional replacement, but if it's maintained properly, the adobe can easily stand the test of time, uh, debunking the myths that earthen materials are not long lasting. Um, mud brick, however, is not only suitable for single story modest structures like the de Vargas house. Uh, here is one of my favorite examples of mud brick architecture. This is the beautiful climate responsive city of Shabam in Yemen, uh, sometimes called the Manhattan of the desert. Uh, this city is uh, composed 
of densely spaced five to 11 story buildings constructed entirely of mud brick. The thick mud brick walls uh, provide cool places to retreat from the intensity of the desert sun. And, uh, and, and it retains that warmth uh, and distributes that evenly as the temperatures drop uh, pretty significantly in the evenings. So the mud brick walls sort of behave as, well, they, they behave as a thermal mass or a heat sink, uh, cooling the hot daytime air and uh, heating the cool nighttime air. Mud brick, while associated with ancient or primitive structures, can and is used to build modern and contemporary works of architecture such as this house here. This is the Mud House in Marfa, Texas, designed by architects uh, Rails uh, San Frantello. Um, and this contemporary home at once uh, fits its kind of far west Texas ethos while being unapologetically contemporary. Okay, now let's return to the four techniques of earth and let's examine sculpted earth. Uh, again, here I'm talking about earth that gains its strength by drying in the sun similar to mud brick, but unlike mud brick is formed monolithically rather than in small standard sized units. Sculpted earth includes techniques such as cob or chenna, uh, each differing slightly in mixture and technique, uh, you know, as they arose independently in different cultures. Um, here you can see a cob wall under construction. Uh, each cob or loaf of earth is mixed with straw or a similar fiber and Using a cob fork, the earth is thrown onto an emerging wall where it is kneaded into the adjacent soil, uh, usually just by someone walking barefoot across the top of the wall, back and forth. And uh, once the wall reaches its desired height, its surface would be simply cut smooth uh, using a large knife and then allowed to dry. And once it's dried, it would be plastered uh, similar to a mud brick building. Um, this technique is even lower in embodied energy than mud brick. Uh, largely due to the fact that it lacks almost any form work um, or, or mold at all. It's one of the lowest embodied uh, materials that I can think of to build uh, architecture with. Um, it's also extremely forgiving and generous. Um, it invites community participation. You see a lot of uh, cob projects where members of the community come out and they sort of gather and uh, it's a very unintimidating way to build. Um, similar to, to mud brick, uh, it's not as strong as compacted earth materials, um, and it can also be slow and somewhat imprecise. However, its casual and approachable nature uh, makes it a very appealing uh, uh, construction technique. The Woodway House in South Devon, England is a good example of a cobbled walled structure. Again, as you can see from the age of the home, Cobb can stand the test of time if properly cared for. In fact, over the years uh, throughout Devonshire in particular, uh, it's been said that people uh, are routinely surprised to find out that the home that they've been living in for many years and that they assumed was a plastered brick building or something similar turns out to be a cob building when repairs are finally needed after generations had long forgotten that, uh, you know, what lie beneath the plaster. Um, perhaps one of the most remarkable examples of sculpted earth uh, in the form of chenna is the great uh, bomb citadel in Iran, uh, which dates back to between the 7th and 11th centuries, you know, it was co continually sort of uh, expanded upon. Uh, once again, it's clear that earth architecture can result in amazing long-lived structures from modest huts to grand fortresses. Today, architects like Mario uh, Cuccinella are innovating with earth, uh, creating cob-like structures using 3D printers. Um, the numerically controlled printers are able to position and apply layers of earth more precisely and intentionally than we've ever been able to do before, um, resulting in such graceful structures as the Tecla domes, as you can see here in Italy, which were completed a couple of years ago. Uh, next, we explore my personal favorite, rammed earth which gains its strength from compaction and vibration, um, and uh, which uh, is used to make monolithic building elements. Um, due to significantly increased compaction forces, rammed earth can be substantially stronger than molded or sculpted forms of earth building. Um, its strength and durability can be, you know, it can start to rival more conventional industrial materials and assemblies, or even surpass. Um, the layering of the rammed earth 
if exposed, can, can and often does contribute to its aesthetic appeal. Um, however, rammed earth does require more robust formwork, which can add cost and embodied energy. It may also require more expensive equipment to reduce labor, uh, you know, uh, labor costs. Um, but uh, inevitably, the material, most of the uh, techniques are rather labor intensive. Uh, rammed earth can be unstabilized. Um, and when I say that, I mean be, it can be used in its raw form without anything added to it, or it can be stabilized, um, usually today with a small amount of Portland cement or lime. And that generally increases its strength and durability. And I'll come back to stabilization a bit later. Um, one of my favorite examples of traditional rammed earth architecture are the Fujian Tolu, built throughout Southeast China. These massive three to four story buildings often take the form of a round or square um, volume with a large courtyard, sort of like a, a large donut. Um, and actually, uh, these, each of these buildings functions sort of like a small village or neighborhood, with the living quarters wrapping around the central space, you know, whole communities living in, in one building. And then the courtyard being a sort of village square um, where marketplace activities occur. Uh, the Tulu often have only one primary entrance to better protect the inhabitants from hostile attack. Um, and the thick rammed earth walls, sometimes exceeding a meter in thickness, um, form a pretty in, you know, impressive uh, you know, wall or fortress. Um, all the openings either tend to face inward uh, towards the market square or are kept high above the ground. Um, so far in my lecture, most of the examples I've shown have been located in hot, arid climates, which we often associate with earthen materials. However, the Tulu are a good example of uh, rammed earth that's located in a temperate, uh, even humid, mountainous climate. Um, this area gets an abundance of rainfall. Um, their broad roofs uh, protect the exposed earthen walls from damage. Um, and it's been shown that, you know, these structures have survived and thrived for several hundred years. Um, today, many contemporary architects are drawn to the combination of sustainability and aesthetic beauty of rammed earth, uh, its unique stratified appearance, um, which is caused by compacting one layer of soil at a time, uh, can be made fairly uniform, it can be subtly expressed, or it can be accentuated. Um, here in the Wendover uh, Contemplation Center by uh, Adlin Dar uh, Darling uh, Design, um, they, uh, they use the kind of warmth and tactility of ramped earth to create a calming, reflective atmosphere. Uh, in the uh, Inkamip uh, Desert Cultural Center, uh, rich and vibrant ramped earth walls sweep across this powerful landscape. And at once, um, you get the sense that they belong to the place while making a powerful architectural statement. Um, here again, the earth is exposed. And through stabilization, um, the earth walls are allowed to be completely exposed to the elements, resulting in a modern yet timeless expression of architecture. OK, and finally, we come to compressed earth block, which is the newest form of earth building. Um, compressed earth blocks, or CEBs, uh, gain their strength through compaction using a specially designed machine, which presses the soil into defined shapes. Uh, this technique tends to be much stronger than sun-dried techniques. And since it is unitized, uh, it requires minimal to no formwork. Instead, it relies more on conventional masonry techniques. In an, uh, its modular nature allows CEBs to be produced off-site, which can result in increased quality control and a reduction in the impacts of inclement weather on the construction schedule. Um, CEBs are typically stabilized uh, with industrial admixtures for added strength and durability. But of course, this has the adverse side effect of increasing embodied energy as well. And again, I'll talk about that a little bit more later in the lecture. Uh, still though, CEBs represent a much more sustainable alternative to most other masonry units. Um, CEBs are synonymous with the invention of the Sinva Ram in 1956 by Raul, uh, Raul uh, Ramirez. Uh, this simple machine uses a long lever arm to compress soil uh, placed in uh, kind of a, a steel hopper 
Um, and uh, originally it would form one brick at a time. Today, there are manual and mechanized versions of this machine that are capable of producing 180 blocks per hour in the manual versions and up to 360 blocks per hour um, in the mechanized versions. Um, and you can produce a variety of shapes, including more complex interlocking bricks. Uh, the 2022 Pritzker Prize winning architect, Francis Keir, uh, by the way, the Pritzker Prize in architecture is sort of like the Nobel Prize of architecture, so it's a pretty big deal. Um, he designed the Center for Earth, uh, 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 sorry, Center for Earth Architecture uh, out of compressed earth block, uh, naturally. And uh, this stunning project uses simple materials and basic forms to create this kind of air of inevitability, which I, I really appreciate. Um, this last example I want to show of uh, in, the, in this compacted section, while technically not a compressed earth block building at all, really, uh, I'm including it here uh, because it was um, designed using a modular approach. Here you can see prefabricated rammed earth panels produced in a factory setting. And here the resulting uh, prefabricated rammed earth building by Herzog and Demeron. Uh, increasingly, architects, builders, and other advocates of earth building techniques are finding incredibly innovative ways to advance this humble material. But why earth architecture in the first place? Well, there are numerous reasons why we continue to use this material. Um, for much of human history, earth architecture was appreciated for its affordability. Soil is abundant and nearly always available locally. Um, it doesn't require intensive resources to extract it, and it can typically be shaped into architectural elements with relative ease. This makes the material quite affordable, at least in a traditional context. And this is why architect Hassan Fatih famously attempted to spearhead a resurgence of mud architecture in his projects aimed at empowering poor communities. And we continue to see earth used in this way. Uh, where you know labor costs are low, earth architecture remains quite inexpensive. However, as labor costs have increasingly absorbed a larger and larger share of the construction budget, earth architecture has become, at least in certain contexts, such as ours in North America, associated with luxury. Rammed earth can be found in quite expensive homes, for example, um, and a, in some parts of the American Southwest, uh, you now see faux adobe homes, which are built um, to acquire a kind of status symbol, um, uh, even though they're you know, a fraction of the cost of real adobe homes and typically far less sustainable and often inferior in terms of building performance. Um, traditionally, earth architecture was quite accessible to the amateur or, or novice builder. Uh, Cobb, for example, is such a forgiving and an unassuming construction technique that it's not uncommon to see communities of all kinds come together and stomp in the mud. Uh, even young children can get into the action. Uh, you see this quite often. Um, you certainly wouldn't see these children working on a typical modern construction site, but here building a cob building seems quite natural. Um, and while this accessibility is still true to a certain extent, uh, as we shift architecture built out of earth, um, to meet the demands of contemporary building codes. Increasingly, we're seeing more industrial scaled construction practices, such as craning in prefabricated rammed earth panels or 3D printing mud walls. Earthen materials, while superficially maligned as weak and short-lived, have been consistently shown, as long as they're well-maintained and well-executed in the first place, to easily stand the test of time. Uh, however, over the course of the Industrial Revolution, when earthen materials fell out of favor, we lost a lot of the knowledge of how to properly build with these types of materials. Um, today, researchers are recovering and advancing traditional uh, knowledge and techniques and combining it with new knowledge. And the promise of longevity remains a powerful characteristic of earth architecture. Earth, in its many forms, is a very human material. We can relate to it. You know, it's variability, it's imperfections and flaws. Um, I personally observed numerous people wringing their hands across a rammed surface in quiet appreciation of its texture or its coloration or its mass. 
Um, after all these years, humans are still drawn to the emotive power of Earth. But of course, the primary motivation for many, maybe most, to consider Earth architecture is its promise of sustainability. Once we set aside the precious topsoil, which we don't use to build uh, earthen buildings with, um, we expose a vast, essentially endless supply of earth, although not always suitable for earth architecture. Um, but generally speaking, it's quite available and uh, we can find earth wherever we are. Uh, and every place has its own specific kind of earth, which gives the architecture its own kind of unique signature. If we think about a typical building process, uh, I've used the term embodied energy several times so far, and I just want to kind of maybe um, explain that in a little bit more detail. Um, the materials that we use in, in, these, in these buildings uh, requires uh, an extraction process. So the materials have to be extracted. We have to transport them. We have, usually have to process them. Generally, we have to transport them again. Uh, we construct with them. Uh, of course, they go through the operation of the building, then we eventually have to demolish them, at which point the material is either recycled or unfortunately too often discarded in a landfill. And this whole cycle uh, captures this idea of embodied energy. And while it's true that this is an oversimplification, the process could be more complex, generally is, um, what this diagram shows is that embodied energy is dependent on how we obtain, where we obtain, and what we do with the material during before, during, and uh, after its useful life. Earth requires very little processing. It's often available locally, and it can last for a very long time. And when required, it can often be recycled, put back in the earth where it came from. However, uh, when we stabilize rammed earth, for example, using industrial materials, we increase its embodied energy. We diminish its ability to be recycled. Uh, ultimately, as we seek to reduce our negative impacts on the environment, we have two basic strategies. We can reduce operational carbon. That is, uh, we can reduce the amount of energy and carbon emissions required to heat, cool, ventilate, light, or otherwise operate our buildings. And over the last couple of uh, decades, uh, in particular, we've gotten pretty good at reducing operational carbon. Um, or we can reduce embodied carbon. Um, that is, we can reduce the amount of energy embedded in the materials that we use to make our buildings. And that's really what I'm talking about here. So as we've come to rely more and more on highly processed uh, materials, such as composites and plastics, we've created buildings that are increasingly dominated by their high embodied energy. Natural materials like earth and timber, um, especially ones that require minimal processing like earth, are really our best tools for reducing embodied carbon. While concrete is an incredibly useful uh, material, it's environmentally harmful. Uh, annually, global production of Portland cement, which is the binding ingredient in concrete, tops, uh, or at least in 2019, it topped uh, 4 billion tons, resulting in as much as 8% of all uh, anthropogenic CO2 emissions. As humanity races to reduce carbon emissions and reverse climate change, I think it's time to re recover humanity's knowledge of earth and architecture and to advance these traditions to meet contemporary society's needs. Um, imagine a bar, or here I placed it on the screen for you. And imagine this bar represents the amount of embodied energy in concrete um, on one side and um, unstabilized rammed earth on the other. Um, to meet contemporary building code, we are likely to stabilize the rammed earth uh, with a small amount of Portland cement. And this, of course, shifts rammed earth from the right further to the left, closer to concrete. It's still good, but it's not as good as unstabilized rammed earth in terms of its embodied energy. And it makes sense given that we've added a portion of cement, which is the primary ingredient that's responsible for concrete's high embodied energy. Now we've used a lot less, but we still added some. On the other hand, advances in concrete, such as carbon capture or carbon cure concrete, are shifting concrete to the right, which is a very good thing. 
Um, however, as a result, the benefits to using rammed earth over concrete might be diminishing. And I think it's time that we begin to think about rammed earth, um, you know, begin to advance it or to think about it in the ways that we've thought about other building materials. Um, one of my persistent research interests has been the biostabilization of earthen architecture, which I believe holds the promise for reducing embodied energy while increasing physical performance. Um, throughout the literature on earthen building techniques, um, one occasionally finds a reference to stabilization using natural and biological materials, including plant and animal materials such as caissons, manure, and blood. Uh, I became really curious about the use of animal blood, um, which is traditionally associated with strengthening earthen materials and is a byproduct of the modern meat industry that largely goes unwasted. So we decided to investigate to see if there is any sort of truth in the kind of traditional knowledge. Suffice it to say, blood has interesting hydrophobic and hydrophilic properties. So we contacted some local meat processing plants and acquired some bovine blood to be mixed with earth as a substitute for water. Uh, here you can see the cylinders are on the right are, um, are uh, biostabilized uh, rammed earth cylinders using that blood. And the result was a not insignificant increase in compressive strength. So it turns out that there is some, some truth to the, um, the kind of mythologies. Um, we took some micro photographs in order to understand what was happening at the grain to grain contacts. And ultimately, while the research satiated our curiosity, blood stabilized rammed earth probably doesn't have much utility in our contemporary context. But it did give rise to other ways to start to think about biostabilization. Um, and so a more substantial line of inquiry for me has been, um, has been in, um, involving the use of microorganisms to strengthen the material. Um, for this, I've collaborated with researchers in soil science and geomicrobiology. Um, the basic idea was to take the standard process of making and testing rammed earth. So we source our materials, we might blend some materials together, um, creating a base soil, we add uh, water, we compact the soil, we end up with rammed earth. In this case, I'm showing a test cylinder. Um, we might test its performance, uh, either you know, uh, testing to make sure that the soil is suitable or testing after we've made some samples to see if it's performing the way we hope. Um, and then, um, you know, so this would be sort of a rammed earth, uh, uh, you know, approach to rammed earth. And then we wanted to marry this with a process called microbially induced calcite precipitation, which in the lab uh, means taking a microorganism such as spore sarcina pasteuri and mixing it or adding a source of calcium. And then we would add a source of urea as well. And then we would take this solution and we would add it to the soil. Basically the urea um, causes the uh, microorganisms to become hyperactive as they feed on it, which raises the pH levels in the soil and causes a chemical reaction with the calcium. Um, that in turn results in the formation of calcium carbonate and eventually bonds the grains of soil together forming something like a limestone matrix. And so, yeah, the idea was just to marry those two things together. Um, we conducted several experiments exploring this concept. And here you can see photo micrographs we took of the microorganisms attached to a particle of soil. The soil is uh, really dark, so it's sort of hard to see, but you can, especially on the right when we zoom in, you can see all these microorganisms attaching themselves to that grain of, of uh, soil. Um, these photographs here show us mixing a solution of microorganisms, urea and calcium, uh, into the soil, creating microbially enriched rammed earth cylinders. And we've employed several different methodologies to deliver the microorganisms, whether it's a liquid solution, whether it's uh, freeze dried, um, and we've tested a variety of different ways to do that. Um, this graph here shows uh, a, a compressive strength of a control unstabilized rammed earth, and then a biostabilized uh, rammed earth variable. Um, ultimately, this research shows real promise, but there's a few obstacles that remain that we continue to work on. Um, now I'd like to spend the remainder of my lecture uh, just looking quickly at a few um, rammed earth projects that have been built, uh, designed and built in my uh, uh, Dirtwork Studio, which is a third year academic design build studio that I've 
taught at the University of Kansas since 2012. The first three projects form a collection I call Prairie Earth, uh, borrowing from William Least Heat Moon's book of the same name. And here I'm um, showing a map of the varying biomes of Kansas. And that little dot that you can see, um, uh, you might be able to see my cursor here. Um, that uh, is a, sort of the transition between the northeastern glaciated region and the Osage Cuestas. That's Lawrence, Kansas, uh, where I teach architecture. And you can see uh, not too far west is the Flint Hills, one of the last great remaining tracts of tall grass prairie in North America. And to the east, as you travel across Missouri, uh, you would encounter the landscape, uh, you know, the eastern deciduous forests. Um, so here, the grasslands of Kansas are further defined. Uh, Lawrence occupies a unique ecotone region, um, this transitional biome. Um, with elements of the central tall grass prairie and the eastern deciduous forests. And we wanted to kind of capture that in this work. Um, a preoccupation with this series then is um, understanding the geology of the land, which conceals and reveals such a potent story. Um, a story of sweeping seas, almost entirely forgotten, of massive sand dunes buried over millennia, um, of receding glaciers and the rivers that they carved, and of a vast network of uh, root systems of the tall grass prairie. Um, <clears throat> that, you know, actually until fairly recently, geologically speaking, uh, characterized this region and still characterizes some parts of the region. Um, so we had a kind of intense interest in understanding the earth beneath our feet. Uh, and this led us to embrace earthen materials. We were also really deeply impacted by the rhythms of rejuvenation in the prairie this sort of uh, cycle of burning the prairie that would have naturally occurred throughout the region, but now is sort of only practiced like a half-remembered ritual to honor the last vest vestiges of the prairie, I suppose. Um, Norbrook Studio is an uncomplicated and modest endeavor. We uh, use simple means and straightforward processes. Uh, we search for resonance between our work and our time and place. And we're always interested in the interplay between the working mind and the thinking hand, um, to borrow from Yohane Plasma. Um, the studio explores theoretical uh, constructs from simple sketches to technical drawings. The physical model uh, is, and scaled mockups and prototypes hold a special place in the studio's toolbox. Um, throughout the design process, the studio often uses models not only to present the work to others and to each other, but to study the, how the design evolves. And, um, and the studio is highly collaborative. We seek to build consensus through um, intense collaboration. We operate under the belief that matter is inherent to architectural form, and therefore materials play a significant role in the design process. Early on, the studio engages in a series of material investigations to coax out uh, the latent potential of a material. Um, we sometimes like to productively misuse materials. Uh, here, you can see students working with rammed earth and making render cylinders, which we test for compressive strength. Um, and the projects that make up this series, um, we would normally test multiple earth mixes before we choose the final one for construction. And of course, critical to the design process is the act of making. Uh, here, though, I just like to stress uh, a point that I make every time I talk about my studio, which is that for me, design build is not simply a pairing of the act of design followed by the act of building, but rather a kind of uh, intricately, uh, in, uh, inextricably linked uh, feedback loop between the two. So while we're designing, uh, we're thinking deeply tectonically about, um, about issues. While we're building, we're, we're always still thinking about kind of the serendipity of the moment and adopting a kind of improvisational attitude toward design execution. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into a couple of projects and I'll go through them pretty quickly so I can leave a little bit of time for questions and answers. Um, this was our inaugural project, the Roth Trailhead. And here in this diagram, uh, we're uh, just communicating kind of the first impressions of the site. When we came out there, um, you know, it's a little piece of prairie next to a woodland hillside. And the impression was one of vast horizontality, uh, flatness, 
And it wasn't until closer inspection of the topographic maps that we recognized how much variation in the landscape there was. And we wanted to register that with a 122 foot long rammed earth wall that it would emerge out of the hillside and gesture toward the prairie um, with a kind of uh, acting as a kind of datum, if you will, so that you could read that, that landscape. Um, we segmented the wall according to the Fibonacci sequence, which is an order found uh, in nature. And between the fifth and sixth segments, the wall shifts slightly to invite visitors to gently move in, you know, from the kind of overall prairie into the trail and, um, and, and into the woods. So here is the Roth trailhead uh, looking from the main road uh, west. Uh, the rammed earth wall marks the trail. Um, the shadows from the canopy play across that raw rammed earth surface. Uh, straight ahead, you can see the opening that guides visitors along that trail. And screened by the rammed earth is a small kind of outdoor classroom space. The monolithic rammed earth masses contrast uh, nicely with this folded sunshade above, which we designed to try to make light and ephemeral. We wanted to cantilever it out. Uh, it only touches the rammed earth in three locations. Um, as an homage to the burning of the prairie, uh, the studio adopted the traditional Japanese technique of shosugiban, charring the wood slats. And this gives them a rich brown coloring, but it also provides protection against weathering and insects. Here you can see the folded roof projecting out over the grasses. Uh, the top of the rammed earth wall, uh, as we envisioned it, uh, creates a kind of datum. So you can see that um, horizontal datum here starting to register the slope of the, of the landscape. Um, with simple materials and basic forms, the studio sought to create a work of architecture that reflects the kind of natural beauty of its given context. Um, we continue that idea in the next project, the Field Station Gateway. This is for the same client, uh, just further down the road. Um, and interestingly enough, this uh, project was sited to the west across the street, it was one of the last remaining uh, tall grass prairie tracks in, in, in Douglas County in Lawrence. And to the right is a kind of volunteer deciduous uh, woods. And so we wanted to capture the overall ecotone region in this little microcosm. So the basic uh, approach to the project was to start with a low horizontal mass and then transition to a taller vertical mass. But basically it was a, you know, a gateway. And so the angle of the wall was positioned to, um, so the visitors to the field station would see it upon approach. We used an existing cattle gate and we repurposed it. Um, we cut it apart and rewelded it so that it would follow the lines of the new rammed earth mass. We continue the charred uh, cedar uh, in the form of a plane that hovers over the, the rammed earth mass to protect the earth below. Um, we use uh, stainless steel rods to let it kind of hover and separate those two materials. Um, the layers of the rammed earth were modeled on the soil horizons beneath the earth. Uh, for us, sort of reinforcing the explicit signage with a more subtle reference to the mission of the field station. And then we did a third project. This was through that gateway at their headquarters building, we designed the Armitage Pavilion, which is an outdoor classroom in sunshade. And it's right next to their headquarters. Um, we basically used a rammed earth wall to screen uh, views to the landscape so that we get these very specific views into, um, into a demonstration prairie. And, uh, and we created a can canopy that kind of attempted to resolve some of the geometries of the primary axis that we were defining and the existing building. So here you can see the pavilion sort of poking up over the prairie. And again, simple material pallet of earth and reclaimed timber um, was used. Uh, we had a very modest budget for this project. We wanted to incorporate a ribbon of, of uh, red earth um, to playfully guide visitors, which pr you know, primarily are children, um, to this outdoor classroom space. Um, the, a kind of novel double cantilever scheme was used to take advantage of limited material. Um, all the material was, were donated reclaimed telephone poles. And so um, in order to make our spans work, we integrated a series of, um, of um, steel cables uh, and I think this is 
for me, one of those great moments where uh, the improvisational nature of the studio uh, becomes apparent. Um, we didn't originally design it like this, but we sort of improv with the limitations of materials. You can see the students at the ribbon cutting. Um, one of our first interior projects we did uh, was here at the Mud Hut. Uh, this is, or otherwise called Marvin Studios on campus at the University of Kansas. And what was interesting about the Mud Hut was it has this great story um, that no one knows about. It's a nondescript, pretty boring building, um, but hidden in plain sight is the earthen building legacy of KU professor W.C. McNown, who uh, essentially had this vision that he could uh, create rammed earth blocks to revolutionize the agricultural construction in Kansas in the 1940s. So this building was built out of rammed earth block. It uh, is a very early example of a modular uh, compressed block, predates the Simba Ram by more than a decade. And the interior of the building was at least as boring as the exterior and it masked this kind of heritage uh, completely. So we were asked to breathe new life into the century space. We wanted to tear down an existing load bearing uh, wall and put in its place an exposed rammed earth wall. The students wanted to be able to magnetize to the wall. So we went around to every automotive shop we could find in the area and we collected all the filings that, you, that come from when you get your brakes rotated and we mixed that in with the earth and voila, it worked. We could magnetize to it. So here's the time lapse of the studio removing the formwork from our rammed earth wall. Um, interest of time, I'm going to skip through. So here we can see our wall, and um, I believe that this is the only fair magnetic rammed earth wall in existence. I could be wrong, but pretty sure it is. Um, you can see those dark layers are the the magnetic uh, layers. We created some vibrations, some sort of undulations in the wood wall next to it to pick up on the vibrating forces of the earth. Um, when it's rammed. Um, we, when we did this uh, fair magnetic uh, um, wall, we did it kind of on a whim. And later, when we were doing it, we noticed that the material was heating up as if there was a chemical reaction taking place. And so later we, just, we thought, well, let's test that to see how it impacts string. Um, and um, so we did our usual tests and here's our pile of, of iron filings or steel filings on one side and our samples, we tested unstabilized, cement stabilized and iron stabilized rammed earth. And we found out that the iron stabilization was as strong as cement stabilization, which we thought was great because we were taking a waste product and replacing it with a high embodied energy uh, product to make our, our, uh, our layers. Um, okay, almost done. So here we have the Sensory Pavilion. This next project uh, was a collaboration with Audio Reader Network, a great not-for-profit organization that provides radio services for the visually impaired. And they have this beautiful uh, sensory garden. It's open to all um, that is designed to appeal to, to everyone's uh, you know, multi-sensory experience. And they asked us to design a little pavilion in the in back of the garden. We decided to exp expand the garden by adding a second path and um, we wanted the pavilion to not be the end of the garden, but rather a turning point. And we wanted to use a rammed earth column as the kind of anchor for that turning point. Um, so here is the pavilion at the back of the garden. Um, the, the garden is such a beautiful place that we were happy to play a kind of supporting role in this project. Um, the pavilion is, is, I think, beautifully but simply designed uh, with a mass timber roof kind of a little butterfly roof, uh, supported by a timber screen, uh, supported by three short or low rammed earth walls and a nine foot tall uh, rammed earth column, um, and a compacted uh, earth floor. Here you can see in our warehouse, um, us prefabricating the uh, mass timber screw laminated roof upside down. And here uh, again, um, looking at the, the pavilion from the back, uh, looking through the screen uh, into the garden beyond. Um, again, all the major components of the pavilion can interlock, the, the roof and the screen all interlock, and they fit down into the rammed earth walls and interlock into the benches. So the whole idea is really kind of one idea. Um, you can see images of the timber and the earth coming together. dappled shadows along that feathered edge. 
And I think while the garden is really beautiful in the spring and really comes alive, I think it's also equally enchanting under a cover of snow, particularly with the warmth of the earth and materials contrasting against the snow. Uh, and interest of time, I'm gonna skip this video and just um, end on one, one final project, which is the Torbeck Community Center. It was a, um, <clears throat> a project we did uh, in Haiti. Uh, we designed after the 2016 uh, Hurricane Matthew struck Southeast, uh, or sorry, Southwest Haiti, um, which um, compromised a birthing center uh, that we had some relationship there. It compromised their ability to provide essential services. So they asked us about a year after that uh, hurricane to come down and to design a 3000 square foot community center that could also serve as an emergency shelter and distribution center. And um, <clears throat> it was essential that the building be resilient, low cost and sensitive to local traditions. So we thought we would take the, um, a simple form um, which arose from a desire to create a kind of welcoming home-like uh, environment. And, um, and we'd use basic materials, uh, earth for the walls to provide um, protection against projectiles thrown during hurricanes and a lightweight, flexible bamboo roof trusses for the roof to provide um, resistance and uh, resilience under seismic and wind loads. Um, in addition to providing the design, the studio constructed uh, some prototypes of the community center and um, went down to Haiti to test our construction ideas and share our techniques with our partners, uh, our local partners there. Um, so we built a little demonstration wall. Um, the wall was designed again using simple reusable timber forms that could be disassembled and then used uh, for other portions of the interior construction. So rather than using sheet uh, materials for the forms, we use board form. Um, this gives the Rand Earth an interesting added tactility, which we quite liked. Uh, after we returned from Haiti, we continued to develop, um, you know, we learned lessons while there and we developed additional mock-ups like this half scale partial mock-up of, of the Rand Earth wall and the bamboo uh, trust. Um, ultimately, the goal was to develop a community center while also modeling the use of local sustainable materials. The labor intensive nature of Rand Earth which is usually seen as a kind of liability, um, we saw as an opportunity to create local jobs rather than spending the project's limited resources on importing expensive materials from elsewhere. Um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up and just say uh, thank you all for listening. And in the remaining time we have, I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, thank you very, very much, Chad. Fascinating, um, bringing uh, us and and I bet you everyone in the audience a uh, new perspective on on really possibly the oldest uh, building method. So I'm sure we have plenty of questions, and uh, so I ask you to, if you have a question, to go to the bottom of your screen and uh, use the raise hand feature, and then we'll call you and you can ask your question. Um, so the first question is from uh, Sam Fisher. Hey, um, thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, I was just uh, curious, because I know bricks can be brittle and um, you know, in San Francisco during the earthquake, you know, that resulted in disaster. I was just curious, how do um, rammed earth and you know, these uh, stabilized rammed earths handle in earthquakes? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thanks for asking that, Sam. Um, well, you know, like any brittle material, tensile strength needs to be uh, considered. Um, you know, uh, uh, early and 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 older uh, earthen projects have uh, suffered from damage during seismic events. Uh, Bomb Citadel, for for example, was was heavily damaged um, uh, through seismic activity a number of years ago. Um, however, I will say that that's true of any brittle material. So concrete, unstable, you know, unreinforced uh, would also uh, not do well in seismic events. So today, you know, based on the knowledge we've learned from from contemporary masonry and concrete projects, we can we can apply those same uh, sets of logics to to earthen materials, whether it's uh, with compressed earth block, uh, um, creating bricks that have uh, void spaces to insert rebar, or whether, for instance, in our Rambrose projects, we use uh, rebar 
uh, steel rebar often. Uh, increasingly, rammed earth builders are looking at more natural ways um, to, to create tensile strength, and hemp rebar has emerged as a really promising way uh, to do that. Um, I will say that the Fujian Tulu, for example, are really, really interesting um, uh, precedent for uh, rammed earth structures that, are, that exist in highly seismic uh, areas. And several Fujian Tulu have been um, damaged by earthquakes, uh, but have survived them in when most other structures around, even contemporary ones, did not. And what was interesting is people observed that over time, and I don't really know the science behind this, but over time, the cracks in one of the, I'm thinking of one example in particular of the Tulu, uh, actually begin to heal itself. Um, the earth over time would wet and then, and then, you know, would essentially it would kind of stitch itself back up. And there, again, there are researchers that have been studying this. So I, I had deferred to them, but, but what I would say is that um, the structures have in many cases stood the test of time, even in seismic areas. So yes, it's true that with a brutal material, you have to be really sensitive to seismic uh, uh, forces, but um, like all good building materials, if designed properly, uh, it should not be an issue at all. I hope I answer your question, Sam. All right. Yeah, thanks um, so much. All right. Next person is Rohan Koppenboyd. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I have a pretty similar question as well. I was wondering how uh, earth structures respond to flooding, like if, they, if a flood happens and they're underwater for an extended period of time and more broadly, do you have to adapt strategies to build in more humid environments or swampy environments? That's also a really great question. Um, so the British, uh, when talking about cob uh, construction, have a saying that a, a good cob building will have a good pair of boots and a good hat. And what they mean by that is that the cob usually shouldn't be in direct contact with the ground. It should be elevated up on a, a, a masonry foundation, concrete or stone. Um, and it should have a good roof overhang. The truth is that earthen materials can get wet. It's not a problem at all. Um, the, the biggest issue is when they are subject to <clears throat> quickly moving water, which could be the case in a flood event. And more challenging is freeze thaw cycles. This is the biggest challenge we have in Kansas, where we have a huge Freeze thaw, a range of freestyle cycles that when any brittle material, this is true of concrete as well, uh, when it gets wet, um, it absorbs moisture. And then if it freezes, the water uh, expands, turns to ice and expands, and then that causes spalling. So what you do with uh, earthen material is you, you coat it so that it's breathable, but it repels um, infusions of, of moisture. Um, again, if built really well, uh, rammed earth can, uh, and other earthen materials can do very well in, in all conditions, even humid climates. Uh, flooding, I'm sure can be a challenge, um, but there, you know, there right now you see a huge uh, kind of push to build rammed earth structures on, on the West Coast um, where seismic uh, issues and flooding are uh, you know, our, our major issues. So again, same kind of answer to the previous question. It's about execution and proper design, but the material can, can certainly stand the test of time. Thanks. Uh, let's have a question from Tyler, Tyler Jackson. Hi there. Um, thank you very much for the uh, very intriguing lecture. Um, one of the things that I've been curious about is looking at a lot of your projects that I guess um, were constructed in Kansas, uh, specifically those outdoor projects. I saw the use of a lot of turnbuckles. Is is there something related to the uh, to your chosen use of those turnbuckles that like display is an enhance and the kind of forces that uh, rammed earth is weak to, or is it um, something external to the ram? earth that um, they're intended to support or resist against? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the, the use of steel cables and turnbuckles in several of those projects has little to do with the properties of the rand earth. Uh, I think it probably has more to do with the uh, kind of evolving language of the studio. Students see past projects and adopt certain um, ideas or strategies from them. 
Um, we do tend to like to contrast the mass of the earth to more delicate kind of material expressions. So sometimes the steel cabling is, is used to just play off of the kind of really simple massive forms of earth. Um, but from a performance point of view, there's really no relationship. It just happens to be an aesthetic choice that we've, we've used on a couple of occasions. All right. Next question comes from Avery Fisher. Hey, uh, I was wondering if rammed earth could be used in every situation concrete could be used in, or if there was some sort of limit uh, to its durability. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, concrete is an amazing material that uh, can achieve things that no other materials can. Um, and for that, you know, for those applications, concrete is, is probably the right material. However, I will say that there are lots of applications where we use concrete and rammed earth could have been used just as effectively. So, you know, when we're talking about one to three story buildings, uh, often concrete is over designed. Uh, the strength of concrete is not needed. Uh, rammed earth could easily achieve um, those compressive strengths. Um, increasingly, we're actually finding uh, builders have been able to achieve 2,500 to even up to 4,000 PSI in compressive strength with, with earth materials, which you could easily build a six story building or more, depending on what kind of loads you're, you're, you're trying to address. Um, you know, if you're talking about, you know, 18 or 20 story buildings, you're probably not thinking about earth anymore. Um, you know, if you're talking about dams or bridges, you're probably not thinking about earth materials, but for, so, for much of the architecture that we build in this country and, and others, rammed earth is incredibly suitable and can help to address a lot of the uh, issues with climate change that we're experiencing. So I do think that you have to design it right and you have to know when it's the right material, but when it is, I think there's just great opportunities. All right, next question from Michael Cherney. Hi, uh, you were discussing a bit about how promising rammed earth is being cheap and sustainable. We also mentioned that it's a little less consistent than other materials that are typically used. So something I was curious about is, are we at a point or what work would we need to get, would still need to be done to get to a point where it could be a safe material and especially in like um, areas with builders who are less experienced using this technique? Oh, these are very good questions. Um, okay. so. Uh, I think there are a couple of, of maybe questions in there. So first uh, is maybe the standardization of earth materials um, or the kind of reliability or consistency. So that is one of the challenges of working with earth is that it's so variable. Like with concrete, the ingredients, you know, you've got cement, you've got water, and you've got aggregate. And aggregates vary a little bit from place to place. Uh, water pretty consistent and cement pretty consistent as well and can be shipped all over the world. So you, you kind of know what you're gonna get. Um, steel, same thing. Timber, uh, more variability and it, engineers often find working with timber for larger buildings to be a challenge for that reason. And the same would be true of, of earth materials because they do vary so much. However, we have really clear ways to test them. And on projects of a relatively significant size, those tests are pretty simple to do. So we can learn about the material that we need uh, or you know, that's available to us and know how to design with it. Um, I will say, however, that one of the biggest barriers to scaling up the use of earth in, in this country is the lack of building codes. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, the only state that has a building code that addresses earthen materials specifically is New Mexico, as far as I know. Um, otherwise, you're generally looking at um, variances, which puts you at the whim of the authority having jurisdiction. So that is a challenge. Um, and as we increasingly use this material, we'll find that we'll develop more and more codes that will help govern how the material is used. We've seen this recently with the rise of uh, mass timber construction, which is also something I'm incredibly fond of. Uh, mass timber construction, which refers to cross-limited timber and other similar, you know, uh, engineered lumber um, in the United States 20 years ago was unheard of 
and it wasn't part of the building code at all. But over the last 10 years, there's been an incredible desire to use this material, so much so that the IBC, the International Building Code, was revised. Um, and the newest version of the code now includes a provision um, for mass timber. And I think that as earthen materials become increasingly popular, we'll need to do the same thing. You see in other countries like Germany and Australia, uh, they are developing building codes that address earthen materials. So that's one thing. Um, but, but also, I think the variability is part of the, it's inherent to the material and it's part of its appeal. That uh, a concrete building in one place is going to look an awful lot like a concrete building designed to the same aesthetic um, preferences in another place. But an earth building in one place is going to look very different from an earth building in another place because the earth varies so much. I think I answered at least one of your questions. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was. Yeah, thank you. Yep. All right. Um, Sid, you have your hand up. Hey, um, so uh, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, you stopped your talk about these materials at gravel. And you could have kept going up in size to larger stones and, and boulders and so forth, which also I see in buildings going around. I mean, what is the, uh, is there a distinction that you just have to cut it off at some point or uh, is there really a, a distinction in the kind of building that you would make with one type of material than the other? Yeah, uh, great question. So um, yeah, I did stop at gravel. Um, there are many examples of rammed earth structures in particular that, uh, so, so with, with mud brick uh, or cob, you're usually using uh, finer materials than even like coarse gravels would probably be perhaps too coarse. Um, but with rammed earth, your, your materials tend to be more coarse. And I've seen many examples of rammed earth structures that incorporate larger stones. Um, however, those projects, like I'm thinking in particular, uh, there are a number of, of fortresses in the south part of Spain, uh, four five-story uh, fortresses made out of rammed earth that have very large cobbles um, integrated in the, in the matrix. But those walls are, you know, sometimes, you know, three quarters to a meter and a half thick. And so the cobbles work perfectly fine. But if we're talking about uh, a 10 inch thick wall and we have stones that are, you know, four inches or six inches in diameter, then it can be challenging to get that to properly compress. So I think it's a matter of the scale of the wall. The gravel tends to work well with the scales of walls that we would build today, but, but you could certainly use larger stones and people certainly have. Um. Can I throw in one question? Um, so you didn't talk much about the ramming part per se. And maybe this is just, uh, I'm curious, it may be good for everyone. If you just said a few more words about, so to what degree do you need to compress things or uh, your, your material so that it becomes rammed earth and so that the clay starts to bind or the microbes uh, start doing their thing. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. I should have I should have described that process in more detail. So, um, so I think building with rammed earth is is so fascinating and interesting. Um, so you build a form, and the form can be two sided. It can be a slip form. It can be a, a complete form. Uh, it can be even be one sided. And I can describe this technique called pisse, uh, which is a kind of play on words. But but usually you have a form, and you will load. The material that's been mixed and moisture has been added and if you have any admixtures or amendments they've been added uh, and then you load that into the forms and then you would um, you would ram it and traditionally you'd ram it using basically poles so the great wall of china a, a large section of that great wall was built out of rammed earth and the uh, poor chinese workers who had to build that used wooden dowels um, and you know, hours and hours, days and days, weeks and months, they would just tamp the earth down. Today, we're lucky we have pneumatic rammers or tampers to do the work much faster. So we can hook up these rammers to a compressor and um, it has a heavy hammer or head on the end of it. 
and has a fast bore stroke. And we can basically run this um, pneumatic tamper along the earth and it compacts. And there are varying strategies or techniques that builders use to make sure that they get good compression as you're running it along the edges and in the interior of the wall and so on. But um, I find that when you work with earth a lot, you start to feel when it's ramped properly. You can hear it. This is the maybe the, the most clear signal to me. It, it shifts from a kind of dull thud to almost a ringing when the tamper is hitting the, the earth. Um, and you can also feel it in your body. Uh, you get a kind of recoil that's a little different once it's really achieved something close to its maximum dry density. And then when you've done that, then you would uh, you would basically start the process again. You would scarify the top of that layer to make sure that the layers adhere well, and then you'd pour your next batch of soil in. But what's fun is you can taper or you can control the wave of that soil. So in a way, like you're not a builder, you're an artist and you're shaping that aesthetic as you make. And you can, you can do it in a very kind of improv improvisational way, like just sort of like, hey, I want this to be a little higher here, a little lower there. Or you could design it in advance as we often do in the studio where we design it you know, visually with kind of elevational graphics. And then we sort of like measure the compaction rate and we figure out how deep we need to go here or there. And we sort of like check ourselves as we make it. And then you're adding pigments to the soil if you want the layers to vary in color. Um, and yeah, and you, just, and you can kind of feel it as you're building it up. And then the best moment in a rainbow wall is when you finish and you're about ready to strip the forms. And it's like opening up a present because you kind of know what you're going to get, but you don't fully know. And so you pull that formwork off and suddenly the wall is there. And hopefully you're pleasantly surprised by it. <laughs> Great. Ah, wonderful. Let's have one last question from Dan Peterman. Thank you, Heinrich. Um, Chad, also, thank you. This has been really a, a pleasure. Um, two really quick questions. One, have you looked at other kind of biological intersections with the earth as you're ramming mycelium, you know, plant, mat, whether it's a living kind of infusing system that might provide stabilization? And the other question is just, have you in your... Uh, in your studio, I experimented with arches, um, spans, um, uh, lintels, etc. Both great questions. So, um, so I'm I'm a huge uh, 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 proponent of natural materials, and I love what's happening with mycelium right now um, as building blocks and other ways to sort of grow our buildings. Um, I have not personally ex experimented with mycelium in rammed earth. Uh, if there's anyone out there who is a mycelium expert and would love to collaborate, uh, feel free to email me. I'd love to, to look into, into whether Chad, or next week potential. I know, <laughs> I know I saw that and I'll be, uh, I'll be attending because yeah, I mean, uh, the living, you know, has been one of the, uh, you know, they've, they've, uh, shined a light on mycelium and what it can do. So, so, so that's great, but I don't have much experience with mycelium. I've been really focused on the microorganisms. Um, and then, um, the other question, sorry, what was the other question? Oh, about arches and vaults or domes. Uh, so we haven't personally done much in the way of experimenting with those, uh, forms. Um, there are others who have, uh, there's a organization called Araville in India that does some amazing uh, vaults and domes using mud brick and compressed earth block. Um, there is a, a very interesting uh, fellow in Germany um, named, uh, I'll probably mess up his name, so forgive me, but uh, Girnot Minki. I hope I got that right. But um, he is an amazing uh, uh, earth builder and he's done some really fantastic uh, um, vaults and domes and arches, but we we have it in my studio. Um, maybe that's something we need to challenge ourselves with next. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, we listened to a fabulous lecture. Chad answered a whole bunch of questions, so let's give him another hand. Thank um, you very much. Thank you very, very much. And thank you all for tuning in. And I hope to see a lot of you next week. Thank you. Thank you.